Isaiah 8, 20 to the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Say with me, covenant practice. Say it loud, covenant practice. Louder. I have proved this for 35 years. When our church had 18,000 plus income in a whole year, we didn't borrow. We didn't bear. We didn't steal. The mystery of covenant practice. We didn't bear. We didn't borrow. We didn't steal. And I can tell you today, for 36 years running, we have never borrowed or begged, not taken a draft from any bank. This thing works. Don't make a mistake. Don't compare this thing with Harvard School of Business Theory. They are too far apart. When Israel came under a siege, and God said, look, I'm the Lord I change now. You are on the course. He said, return to me and I will return to you. We are rich, I will return to you in tithes and in offerings. Every truth of scripture is valid for all times and applicable to whosoever is interested. In tithes and in offerings. In tithes and in offerings. In tithes and in offerings. He said, bring all the tithes to my house. That will bring to my house. Prove me now here with. If I will not pour you out the window, open to you the windows of heaven, and pour you out the blessing until you shall have not room enough to receive it. Please understand, God does not change. Until you return, your glory cannot be restored. Until you return, your glory cannot be restored. You have wealth in your redemptive package. He became poor that you and have might be made rich. But the way to it is covenant practice. Whatever it says to you to do, do it. Do it. Do it. Now, you receive for us power. Revelation 5 12. Riches, wisdom, strength, glory, honor, blessings. Had the nation of Israel ruled by God who mediated his rule through the priesthood, 24 courses of priests. They were basically the officers of theocracy. They mediated the rule of God through the revealed law of Moses to the people. <clears throat> and the people needed to supply funding for those officers, the, namely the priests and the Levites who served along with them. Um, so there was a a tithe tax that was essentially the basic tax to fund the national government. It was one-tenth of whatever it is that you earned. Uh, it could be commodities, uh, not particularly money, grain, fruit, whatever. Um, then you had a second tithe every year, which was to fund the national celebrations, the feasts, the festivals, uh, to provide all of that that the nation Israel engaged in, and there were a whole series of feasts, as you know, and uh, funding temple events when the whole of the people came together, like the Passover and all those things. Then you had a third tenth every third year, which was the poor tax that was distributed to the people who were poor. So if you split that into every year, it's about three and a third percent every year. So essentially every Jew paid 23 and a third percent with the addition of a fixed amount of temple tax, with the addition of they couldn't harvest the corners of their fields that had to be left for profit sharing to let the poor take that. If you dropped a bale off your wagon when you were harvesting, you couldn't pick it up. That again would supply for needy people who would hang around the fields to pick up and glean whatever they could get. 
So you might say that it could be somewhere between 24 or 25 percent of, an in, of the income of an Israelite living in the kingdom that was funding the national government. That really was taxation. That never was free will giving. That never was what we would call free will. In Malachi 3, when God says, why will you rob me of tithes? That's what he's talking about. Talking about. Free will giving in the Old Testament was whatever you wanted to give. Whatever you wanted to give. You have illustrations of people giving all different kinds of amounts. Um, a tenth of a tenth was given uh, in, in, the, in the Pentateuch. Um, when they built the, the temple, you remember people were told to bring whatever they wanted to bring? And they brought gold and they brought jewels and they brought everything and finally they brought so much that they had to say, stop bringing, we have too much, it's, it's an overload. Um, in the book of Proverbs, it simply says, give the first fruits, doesn't say an amount. Uh, be generous, etc. So you had taxation, which was fixed, and you had free will giving, which was flexible based on the heart of the giver. The same thing is in the New Testament. Even though Israel ceased to be a theocracy because they're occupied by the Romans, Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Pay your taxes. The Apostle Paul says, pay your taxes, Romans 13. And Jesus said, give whatever you want to give. But here's the principle, Luke 6, 38, give, and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The simple principle is that whatever you give, you invest with God, and He gives you a return, or the language of Matthew 6, where He says, lay up treasure in heaven. Or in Luke 16, use your money to purchase friends for eternity. That is, use your money for gospel enterprises because then people will be converted by your giving and they'll be there to welcome you when you enter into heaven. Be faithful over little and the Lord will give you much. Uh, don't serve God in money. All those are general principles. So the simple thing is this. Tithe was never in the Old Testament a means of free will giving to the Lord. It was the way the theocracy was funded. If you study the story of Joseph, you'll also find out that it was 20% that Joseph determined should be the tax in Egypt. And that, that really is the historic base for the American taxation system, which uh, not too many years ago was, was basically about a 20% tax and uh, is still for perhaps a uh, majority of the population. So pay your taxes and fund the government. The Jews in the time of the room and, uh, and give to the Lord what you want. Uh, the Jews in the time of, of Jesus had a real difficulty with the tax part because their, their tax money was going into the hands of Rome. And the tax collectors were the, were the scum because they were Jews who bought tax franchises from Rome and then prostituted them into a way to get rich like Zacchaeus and Matthew. Uh, they extorted money. So tax collectors were Jews who had betrayed their heritage, who were collecting taxes for the pagan, idolatrous, occupying Romans, who were extorting more money than they should. The Romans set a fee for a tax franchise. We need this amount uh, each year from the zone that you operate in. Whatever else you can get, you can keep. So tax collectors were surrounded by a, by a mafia, thugs and uh, strong-arm people who would extort the money out of the people. They became very, very rich. And that's why they are always categorized with sinners, with the scum and the riffraff of society. They couldn't attend a synagogue. They were basically despised in the culture. So uh, the Jews were reluctant then to pay their taxes because they knew that it was going to the occupying and adult, uh, uh, idolatrous Romans. And so when Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar, this was a shattering realization. Jesus also, you remember, paid his temple tax. Uh, he had a rather convenient way to do that, you know, catch a fish and take it out of the mouth of the fish. But, you know, this was part of what he, he wanted to teach us to do. So the bottom line is, always been the same throughout all redemptive history. Pay your taxes, support the government, be a good citizen. Paul makes that clear, Romans 13, uh, elsewhere. Um, and give God whatever you want to give. And the principle for giving is 2 Corinthians 8, so sparingly reap sparingly, sow bountifully, reap bountifully. Whatever you give to God is what you get a return on. If you want a small return, you give a small amount. If you want a big return, you give a big amount. God keeps very careful records. Not only will you enjoy His blessing here, but you will enjoy His blessing eternally 
in the reward that awaits the one who is the bountiful giver. That's the principle. I assume you're not uh, promoting a prosperity gospel in, in that explanation, or are you? No, no. Uh, the Lord has I'm saying is to bless the faithful giver. And I think one of the reasons the Lord blesses the faithful giver is because a faithful giver being blessed is able to give more. It's not an indulgent kind of thing. There are no guarantees, however, that you're going to be rich at all. Um, the prosperity gospel is a, is a deception. It's a, it's, a, it's a pyramid, you know, it's a scheme. It's a con job that makes the people at the top very, very rich.